good morning. I'm glad to have each and every one of you here today. They've got me down for doing announcements. I don't know about you, but if Susan sends me to the store to get something that's more than two items, she makes me write it down, and there's a good reason for that. But today, if you'll look in your bulletin, we've got a wealth of information of things we need to pay attention to. And uh, first of all, I want to mention the fact that we lost Roger McDonald this last week. And as the uh, bulletin states down here, Roger and Dorothy were here uh, when I first came, but he was here from something like 93 to 2010. And uh, of course he passed away and they're gonna be having his celebration of life and memorial out there at Garland, Texas. glad yeah and I'm sure between now and March 16th we may can put something there because Susan and I my daughter lived in Texas and we made a detour and saw Roger this was after Dorothy had already passed and and I, I'm so glad we went out there to see him in Garland when he left here also if you'll notice uh, Jerry Mahan's father-in-law Henderson Ponder passed away and that's Claudette's dad and you need to remember uh, them and the family and uh, like I said we're going through a lot of preachers here because Jerry was our preacher here for uh, I think it was 2014 to 2000 and, and uh, well no that was John it, he was here before uh, right after uh, Roger left and uh, was here uh, during that time period uh, the other thing, and, and I hope as you came in this morning, last week Jody Long with CBF uh, gave a seminar after our Love Feast for Missions. And uh, while I'm mentioning that, we took in a good amount of money for Love Feast, and I appreciate that. That means a lot. But uh, he, he did a seminar and broke us up into groups. And if you look on the back of the uh, church sanctuary back there, we posted, he broke us into groups. We talked about where we want to go from here and looking for a new pastor. And, uh, and he wanted to uh, point us in the right direction, offered their help as far as CBF with securing a pastor down the road and, and would be there uh, to help us. And that brings me to the third thing that I've got on my card here, and that's John White. John was the, the interim pastor after Jerry left, Jerry Mahan and before John Paul was uh, called, and that was 2014 and part of 2015. And uh, we voted last week to call him. He'll be working as a full-time, part-time interim. And uh, that's a step in the right direction because Matt did a good job, but he was simply here, and all he could do would be our supply preacher, and he did a good job. And like I said last week, we'll have him on speed dial if John can't be here, and you certainly don't want me to preach. So without further ado, we're glad to have John back. He's going to help us and try to work with our, our preacher search committee. That'll be the next thing. So when we call and ask you to be on that committee, the answer is yes, I'll be glad to. So keep that in mind. All right, John, at this time, I'm going to invite you up and turn the service over to you. I'm looking forward to seeing what the Lord's put on your heart. Today. Thank you. your book we are so glad to have you with us today uh, Reverend White we appreciate you you serving with us here uh, let it, at this time we'll open our service with our opening hymn we have heard the joyful sound please stand and remain standing if you will for our opening prayer Thank you. 
pray together? Lord, we thank you so much this day for your amazing grace, that blessed and happy day when by your grace we were saved. We trusted Jesus with a simple childlike faith, and you came into our lives, and things have been different since then, and how you've blessed and nurtured us through the years. We're thankful today for not only your saving grace, but your sustaining grace, that you keep us, that you bless us, that you guard us, that you enable us, and that when we need so very much your grace, you are there. You have been there, you will be there. Lord, I celebrate today being here in this place with these wonderful people to once again renew some friendship and to engage in ministry together. Lord, we pray your spirit to be with us. We understand the mission before us. We understand that an exciting day awaits in that future, a day when this church will celebrate a new pastor coming on board and a new vision for ministry. God bless them. Give them hope and peace, we pray this day, each one of us. Lord, we thank you so much that whatever may be going on around us, what goes on within us is so much more important when Christ is Lord of our lives and you are working in ways that are beyond our imagination today. Even though the world seems to be in dire need, our very nation, our very culture seems to be in such a difficult place, we know that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So Lord, bless this hour together. Bless our worship service. We thank you for this choir. We thank you for Brother Jim who leads the singing, directs us. We thank you, Lord, for those who've gone before us. We thank you for Roger McDonald, for his great ministry, for his influence and witness. We thank you, Lord, for what he has meant to this church and to many others. Bless his family and bless his memory. And uh, may in this time we celebrate uh, what he has done and what he has meant to this church and to this world. So God be with us. Speak to our hearts today. Guide our thoughts. We'll be careful to give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Every man, woman, and child at Horizon should be involved in missions, whether it's sharing your money, your time, or your talents. And I think giving back to God shows our love for him. This is normally when I would ask the children to come forward and to collect change for missions. But of course, this is a different kind of Sunday. So we are changing that, and we will be collecting your mission change at the back of the church as we leave today. So make sure that there will be somebody there with a basket, and so make sure you will leave your change for them. And maybe next Sunday, we will have our children to come forward. Thank you. We have a story to tell to the nations. Hymn number 427. You may remain seated as we sing together.
we always wear out the choir and they have them sing, especially if you make it. Please stand now, if you will, for our offertory hymn, number 581.
let us pray. As we heard in this song, we realize how much you love us, Lord. And as we come now to receive the offering, to give back something and show our appreciation for all that you give us, we'd ask that you'd bless this offering, multiply it, and help us to provide a service here in this community and throughout the world. We ask it in your name. Amen. Please stand for the doxology. <clears throat> I am so happy to be here with you all again. It seems like just yesterday that I was here, but when I look around, it, I realize that some of y'all have changed. <laughs> Only two or three, maybe. Wow, it's great, though, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I know what my task is, what my mission is, and I'm delighted to be able to be with you in that task. On the board, on the wall back here, are some things you did last week uh, as Jody Long led you. This gives some insight into where you are and what your dream is. I'm going to study that myself, and I hope you will too. Look it over. It's a great future is ahead, and uh, embracing that future and getting together to make that happen is uh, very important. This morning, my scripture text is the, um, uh, from the first chapter of Mark's gospel, and I want to give you a little background. Mark is the shortest of the synoptic gospels, synoptic Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, John is not considered a synoptic, but anyhow, it's the shortest of all those gospels. It is uh, written uniquely. It starts out with no genealogy. It doesn't tell anything at all about how Jesus was born. The birth narratives uh, belong to Luke and Matthew. Mark begins with action. 
And action is part is the key word in Mark's gospel. Jesus at work, Jesus moving. Uh, over 40 times in Mark's gospel, the word immediately is used. Immediately, Jesus did this. Immediately, this person acted. And so in those, Mark gives us the idea that in those short three years of Jesus' ministry, things happened fast, and indeed they did. Here in this first chapter of, of uh, Mark, for example, uh, you know, early on, he just covers quickly the... Um, the, the, the ministry of John the Baptist, and then he quickly covers the baptism and temptation of Jesus. He doesn't spend a lot of time on it. Uh, he mentions the fact that when he was baptized, the heavens opened, and the Spirit of God descended upon him and said, you are my son whom I love. Uh, with you I'm pleased. And then in just a short little paragraph, he covers the temptation of Jesus, going to the wilderness, and he was there tempted by Satan, Mark says. And then he calls the, the disciples, calls the first disciples, and they, without delay, follow him. Uh, basically, Mark doesn't cover all the disciples throughout. He focuses on Simon Peter a great deal. Simon Peter becomes a key figure in, in the life of Jesus and in the early church in the book of Acts. And uh, Mark, uh, of course, wrote Acts as well. And so he, he says, you know, to Theophilus, whomever that was, in the first treatise I sent to you, blah, 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 which is talking about his gospel. And then he goes on to, to deal with the, 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 what we have in the book of Acts. But here in the first chapter, very first chapter, Jesus goes to the synagogue, which is the Jewish worship place, and there immediately cries out a e person with an evil spirit. Now, whatever that might mean in our present-day vernacular, I would have to say, we would say, well, that person was a little bit off. He was not right. Or he was maybe mentally ill. At any rate, he cried out, Jesus, you know, help me. And, um, or in some cases, we don't want your help. But Jesus spoke to them and calmed them and brought out of them that evil spirit. However, you might want to translate that into your present language Needless to say, Jesus healed them and put them in their right frame of mind. People were amazed and said, what is this, this new teaching that you have here? This is wonderful. Wow. Well, they left the synagogue then, and they come to a place called Capernaum, which becomes sort of the headquarters of Jesus' work in Galilee. Capernaum was also the place where these, many of these disciples lived. Simon Peter was there. His mother-in-law was there, and she was sick. She was very ill. And Jesus went to the home, and he healed her. Okay. She was in, uh, down, and he said, you may get up, and, and so forth. And so she did, and she began to not only get up, but she waited on them, and what a wonderful thing that was. And so all of a sudden, people in Capernaum started bringing their sick people to be healed and, and bringing their, their uh, people who were demon-possessed or mentally ill, bringing them to Jesus to, to, to heal. And, and the crowds grew and grew. And nightfall came, and they went to bed. Early the next morning is where we find our text today, and I'm going to start reading here in verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Why have we come? Jesus made it clear in his own mind, throughout his ministry, what his mission was. Why was he there? What was his purpose? However, the disciples struggled with that. They had an idea what his mission needed to be. 
and struggle with getting him to fit their idea. Well, interesting. So I've chosen this text today so that you and I might answer the question, why are we here? Why are we here? First of all, let me tell you why I'm here, okay? A little personal stuff here, okay? We were here in 2014, left in 15 before John Paul came and uh, moved to the lake in uh, Lake Sinclair. We were there for a few years, then moved to Social Circle and were there for a few years, and then we moved to Tiger, Georgia, which is in Rabin County up in northeast Georgia. Throughout that time, I've been doing interims here and there, serving churches here and there. Backing up, in 2011, I retired when I was passed from the pastorate of the First Baptist Church of Fort Oglethorpe. Prior to that time, going back to 2000, I started attending seminars, preparing for the ministry of interim, an intentional interim, after I retired. I thought I might retire earlier than I did, but I didn't. I went ahead and continued to 2011, and then I've been doing interims since that time. It's a great ministry. I've enjoyed it so much. And I had the privilege to serve here in this church for that period of time. When I found that John Paul was resigning and leaving, I thought, oh, I, I love that church, and I'd love to be of support in some way to help them. And I indicated that to some of your members, and the word got around, and you contacted me. And, but I live three hours from here. And we thought, there's no way I can commute three hours, not at my age, okay? Now, I'm over 39. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm 81. And uh, there are some people who think that an 81-year-old is just too old to do anything. Well, uh, I may be. I've always believed, though, that what you do is you use your leftovers. We always used our leftovers. And what we have left is what God can use, and I'm willing to do that. Now, if during the time that I'm here with you all, you determine that I don't have enough left over, just let me know, okay? And I'll quietly drive back to Raven County. <laughs> but I, I really think that we can, do, we can do something here together. Now, let me tell you why I'm here, actually. I'm here by a miracle. I was blessed with a wonderful wife. We've been married 61 years, and she affirms my work and my ministry. She tells me that I am one of the best preachers she's ever heard. She used to tell me I was the best until we came here and heard Jerry Mahan preach. And she said, boy, he's good too. <laughs> she liked his short sermons. His sermons were much shorter than mine typically are, but you've been blessed with good pastors through the years, and Jerry was certainly one of those and did a good work. But my wife has supported my work, and she's encouraged me. She keeps saying to me, you can, you're, you can still do it. And so when this opportunity came, she encouraged me to come. She's not, she didn't come with me. She'll be with me on occasions, but not on a regular basis. She has her ministry in Raven Gap. We are members of a church in Raven Gap, and she's in the choir, and, and she's very important to that choir, and I want her to enjoy her ministry and stay there. She's followed me all these years, and I've said, hey, you don't have to follow me now. You can you do your ministry, and I'll do mine, and uh, it's worked so beautifully. I'm so thankful for her. Without her support and encouragement, I would not be here. I told her last night before I left, Linda, if you should ever tell me that you want me to be right here with you, I will be right here with you, I promise. And so she hasn't told me that. She may be glad to get rid of me. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't want to go there. I'm not going to ask her that. But uh, at any rate, thank the Lord for her. And then a place to stay. I needed an apartment, a place to stay. I didn't want to stay in a motel, you know, or, or sleep in my truck. I, so so I, um, I, I contacted a friend there, one of my former neighbors at Whippoorwill Hollow off of Vanning Mill Road, and he had a 
place that he'd lived in for five or six years while he was building his mansion up on top of the mountain, and it was available. It was empty, and he made it available to me at a very reasonable price, and it's wonderful, and I'm so happy to be back there in that place, it's like going back home after 10 years in a sense, and being back here with you is so important. This is such an important time. Horizon is a wonderful church. We came and joined here after we retired at Fort Oglethorpe. We joined here because you're our kind of people. You thought like we thought, and, and you, you were engaged in, in a unique approach to ministry in this community, and I commend you for that, and I, and I love that. And so it's, it's a wonderful time for me to be back here with you. I'm here, by, I think, by divine appointment. I feel like that this is what the Lord has led me and brought me here to do. And I hope that you will, you will um, affirm that as well. Now then, let me ask you, why are you here? Okay? Why are you here? That's a good question, isn't it? I believe we're all here because someone went before us, someone of influence, Someone of special spirit went before us. Maybe a long time ago, certainly. 32 years ago, this church was founded. And um, it was founded by, a, well, based upon some very important principles that that group of Baptists believed in. Powerful views. Do you know what those are? Walter Sheridan has written a book entitled The Four Facts. Four Fragile Freedoms of Baptist. One of those is a free church, a free church in a free state. That is a church that has no group or organization over it telling us, telling you what to do. That's important. You govern yourself. I've often said that a Baptist church is the truest democracy on the earth. We're, we govern ourselves. Everybody has a vote. Everybody has a voice. And that's dangerous. <laughs> it's messy. Because democracy can be messy at times. Sometimes we have to work it through. But here's the great thing about a democracy. We can work it through. Given time, given time, the people will work it out. I believe that. And uh, so that's one of the great principles. Another thing is a free Bible, a Bible that is free for interpretation, a Bible that is open to each person, of each one of us interpreting that scripture. Some of the greatest scholars I know didn't go to college. They just bought some commentaries and books, and they got into the scripture, and, and they were labored on it, and they became great leaders, great Sunday school teachers, even some great pastors. Many of our leaders among Baptists are people who never went to school. I'm not, I'm not honoring that. I'm not extolling that. I'm just, as a matter of fact, I believe that if you're called to the ministry, you ought to, you ought to go to school. You ought to do the best you can to train yourself. But some people didn't have that opportunity. So a, 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 a free Bible and then a free ministry. Every person free to minister as God calls us all to ministry without any prejudice, without the distinction of maleness and femaleness and black and white and Jew and Gentile. We're all one in the body of Christ, and each of us can minister. That's an important principle, and this church uniquely holds that principle. We are, you are a church that is open to men and women equally serving in the ministry. And then the principle of, of, of freedom of, of the soul, soul freedom, a free soul before God, that each of us stands before God. We don't have a priest between us and God. We believe in the priesthood of every believer. Powerful, powerful view. And religious freedom. Religious freedom. We are free. And the separation of church and state. Those are important principles that this church believes in, and was founded upon. Those are important things. We're here in the sh on the heels of those great principles. We're also here on the shoulders of, of devoted leaders over the years. 
your pastors, Steve Sheely, first of all, Dr. Roger McDonald, who was here for a long time uh, as, as pastor, and then Jerry Mahan to follow, and then John Paul Harris. All good men, good men who love the Lord and who have done some wonderful things for this church and so forth. We're here on the shoulders of those people. We're here on the shoulders of great lay men and women. When I was here with you before, I had great friends here, people that I look forward to seeing often. Uh, Robert Floyd always was out in the foyer and, and welcomed me. He, we always had some funny joke or something to share together. He was such a good man, humble man, but real, genuine man. And of course, his wife, who I didn't know. And then Jack Herring. Remember Jack? What a great guy Jack was. Enjoyed him. We played a little golf with Jack and and uh, he, was, he was just a super guy. Um, Wileen Selman was here when I was here, and we had lunch with her occasionally at Out to Eat. What a wonderful lady she was. And um, uh, Oliver Moorhead and Peggy, uh, James and Marlon Meredith. Oh, what wonderful people. Um, Mar Marlon leading the choir. And uh, uh, we're just, just uh, we're here on their shoulders. We're here in their honor. We do not forget them. They're part of us. They're part of this church. Part of the past, and they will be part of the future. And in the future, you will be remembered for your faithfulness, your devotion, your love. Why are you here? You are here because you love the Lord, because you love the church, because you love this ministry. Some of you have been faithfully involved in this ministry for a number of years. Beth, you were here when I was here before, still playing the piano beautifully, doing great. Appreciate you. And those people back in the sound booth, oh, great to have them. They're doing so well, so great. I talked with little David Mangan this morning. I said, Dave, remember the children's sermons we had down front? He said, yeah. I said, we're going to start those again. Come on down this morning. <laughs> you know what he said? I'll be down there. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? What a great young man. Great family. My goodness. Why are we here? Why are you here? Those are important things. Important things. We're here because of a priceless heritage and a precious ministry that lies ahead. Back to our text today. The disciples came to Jesus that morning. He was out in a per personal, private place to pray early. They came looking for him. Lord, hey, come on here. The people are gathering. This is the opportune moment, man. If you come back here, we can. This, there's no limit to how big this crowd can be. The whole town is ready to come out, and, and you, you're just sweeping people off their feet, man. This is the exciting opportunity. Can't you just see that? Can't you understand the, 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 the excitement, the momentum that those disciples felt was, was happening? Wow, this is the moment. And Jesus said, Oh, let's go to some other towns today. No. The crowd is not why I've come. I've come to preach. Interesting, isn't it? To preach in other places. Preach. Preach what? Preach, proclaim, uh, to proclaim the kingdom, a kingdom, a kingdom that is not of this world. It was, it was different. Jesus. Now, it's important for us to try to get into the mind of Jesus here, to understand what compelled him and what prohibited him from playing the game that the disciples wanted him to play. It was a sideshow, what was happening in Capernaum. It was not the real show. And Jesus knew the difference in the sideshow and the real show. Now, this is something that's important for us, to be able to distinguish in our minds between the sideshow and the real show. What is real? 
and what is not real. There are a lot of sideshows, and a lot of folks are going to the sideshows. A lot of folks get caught up in the sideshows. But there are a few people who stay with the real thing. And that's why we're here, to stay on the real thing, to stay on track to stay where God put us, where he leads us, where he wants us to be. A few years ago, I was back in Alabama. My mother was uh, sick for a while, and she loved to ride, and I would take her out riding. And, and I once pastored a church out from my hometown of Clanton down in Otago County called Indian Grave. And I said, well, we'll drive down to Indian Grave. And we drove through there, and I recognized so many of the places. Oh, yeah, wonderful people there. And I drove past an old deacon's house uh, named Ivan Smith. And, and um, I thought, well, I wonder what's going on with Ivan. I haven't heard from him in a while. I know Louise, his wife, had passed away. And, and I saw some smoke curling up from the backyard, and so I said, well, he may be outside. I went out, drove up into the driveway, and got out and walked back into the back, backyard. And Ivan was sitting down on a, on a log, burning some trash and some leaves and and some trash and stuff. And I walked up and we chatted. It was good to see him. He was glad to see me. We had a good little chat. Then he said to me, Brother John, I don't know why I'm still here. He was 86 years old at that time, and his wife had died. He wasn't in great health. I don't know why I'm still here, he said. I said, Ivan, I know why you're still here. He said, really? I said, yep. You're still here because you're the same person you were 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. You're the, same, you're the same person. He was a hero during World War II. He single-handedly, with one other person, stormed a German bunker and took out a machine gun that was killing our soldiers at that time. He was awarded medals for that. He was a war hero, honored and respected in that church and community. He was a deacon, chairman of the deacons for years, just a great person. I said, you haven't changed. You've just gotten older, and a few things around you have changed. But listen, this church needs you, Ivan. This church <coughs> needs you. You are important to this church. Please don't forget that. And I left, you know, and went my way. Ivan lived another year and a half. But someone told me that he something happened in his life. He he seemed to get a new breath of fresh air and came back and, and made an more of an impact there toward the end. He finished strong. Finish strong. You're here for a purpose. Here for a reason. Finish strongly. You're valuable. You're important. It means something. It means something. If you're hiking, you want to stay on the trail. If you leave the trail for some reason, you want to be very sure you mark your path so that you can get back. Some people leave the trail and forget to mark their path, and they get lost. There are many fatalities on the trails, the big trails especially, where people get lost and just don't find their way back. The woods are great. Many people lose their way, not only in the woods, but in life. How easy it is, like Ivan, to suffer losses, to be sick, and to not feel that you're useful anymore and to think that you have no purpose any longer. Why am I still here? I hope that we can reaffirm all of our lives as long as we live. I'm here to serve God as long as I can. I'm here to be who I am, who I've been all these years for the glory of God. Important.
Doyle Rogers was a good friend of mine over in Lakemont, Georgia. He died a few months ago. Doyle, at age 19, was a young boy who was drafted into the Army during the Vietnam War. He grew up in the mountains of, of northwest Rabin County. Before he died, he had cancer. He asked me if we could, we could go visit his home place where he grew up, where he was born, in Plum Orchard, Plum Orchard Road. And I said, sure we can. And we got in my Jeep and we took off. And we went as far up Plum Orchard Road as you could go. And we had to stop because a tree had fallen across the road. So we stopped and walked a, a, probably a mile, and he was worn out. And he, finally, he, I said, Doyle, we need to go back. You, you're exhausted. And he said, okay. So we went back. Doyle told me this story. At age 19, he went to Vietnam. After training, infantry training, he was assigned to a squad a reconnaissance squad. They went out and found the enemy. Their goal was to secretively, clandestinely locate the enemy and then inform those, the artillery or whomever, where the enemy was. A very dangerous situation. After being there for about, on, the, on, the, on those trails for a while, he was made squad leader and given the rank of sergeant, which is unusual. At age 19, he was still 19. In, in charge of this squad. And um, I asked, well, why did they make, why was that? I was, was, it, was the loss of lives so great? He said, oh, no. He said, they did that because they recognized where I was from, that I was from northwest Georgia, and I knew how to follow a trail. I knew what was on those trails. He said, I could, I could trail a deer, and he never knew I was there and get him. And he said, that was my gift, my genius. And they made me squad leader. And my goal was to not only find the enemy, but was to save the lives of my squad. And he was successful. The only problem was he stepped on a landmine and lost his foot, blew his leg off below the knee, and was shipped home. Follow a trail. Follow a trail. If we follow the trail, then we can be leaders. If we get off the trail, we become followers. Challenge is on, is on for every one of us to be leaders. Horizon Church to be a leader. It's important. We're leaders. God has given you an important mission. Let's get that mission done. <coughs> Finally, this story. We had a building program at Fort O. One day, a gentleman named Archer Glenn, some of you may have known Archer, came to my office and sat down and said, I need to talk with you, Pastor. He said, I want to, I want to make a donation to the church. I said, wow, that's great. We're open to that. Had a building program going, needed the, uh, needed the funds. He said, I want to donate a house. He had a rental house, a nice house, and a lot. I'd like to just donate it to the church. We can... You, <coughs> Use it as we want or sell it and get the money, whatever. I said, man, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't, ever, hadn't had anybody do that before. He said, yeah. He said, my parents inspired me. He grew up in Chickamauga. His parents were members of the First Baptist Church of Chickamauga. And when he was a boy growing up, they donated a house to the church in a building program at Chickamauga. And he said that at that time, he said, I didn't understand it. it it shocked my mind, but he said, as I've gotten older and looked back on it, he said, I realized that was part of their Christian commitment. They were wonderful parents who loved the Lord. And he said, I'm not the kind of person they were, but I want to see what, do what I can do. I want to follow their example. I want to give. You know, it's true in life that you and I may have a chance to do something really significant, really important. And we may not know it. We may stumble into it and we may stumble out of it. But listen, if we follow the path, if we follow the track, if we stay on course, then it could happen. And God will get the glory. And God's people will come together. 
And God's word will go out. And the work will pro progress. And we'll see some good things happen. Some have blessed the path before us. Let's bless that same path and follow. May we pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the privilege to be here today. All of us are here because of actions that are beyond our comprehension, beyond our capacity to govern, but by the grace of God, we're here. By your grace and by the goodness and dedication and devotion of those who've gone before us. And so, Lord, here today, we dedicate ourselves to you, to use us, to honor yourself in any way that you can through us. Bless your church, O oh Lord. Let your spirit, I pray, come and empower every part of us and use us for your glory together in Christ's name. Amen. So our hymn of invitation today, our hymn of commitment, is, um, in, uh, is written in your bulletin, and um, we're going to be singing together, Share His Love, number 435, Brother Jim. Share Let me remind you that I will be here at the church, actually I'll be in the area Saturday night through Tuesday, sometimes Tuesday night. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to be available to you. Call on me, okay? I'll be, this, of course the office will be my headquarters, I'll, but uh, if, I'm, if, if I'm at uh, the apartment there in Whippoorwill Hollow, 
you cannot get me by cell phone. It'll be a landline only. We'll publish that in, in the newsletter and put it in the, in the, in the uh, bulletin next week. Call Steve Mullis, and he knows how to get in touch with me. Uh, but um, So I want you to feel free to call on me. If you'd like to just come by and talk, I'll be happy to listen. I'd love to talk with you. Um, if I need to make a visit at, for someone you know, let me know. I want to work. I want to, s to be here to help you and, and serve you. I'll be meeting with the pastor search committee and with others who might need my support and my, my help. I'm looking forward to doing that. In the 60s, in the 1960s, how many of y'all remember the 60s? Oh, yeah, yeah. We remember that really well, don't we? We don't remember about yesterday very well, but we know the 60s. In the 60s, there was some interesting music, the 50s and the 60s. In my opinion, the best music in the world. <laughs> but there was one piece of music written by a guy, or sung by a guy named Larry Vern, entitled, uh, Please, Mr. Custer, I Don't Want to Go. Remember that one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was, a, it was called, it's called in the vernacular of music, a Halloween song. I guess it's because it's scary. <laughs> the idea is this soldier is in General Custer's army out there in, in the Dakotas, and they're, they're being attacked by the uh, Apache Indians and overrun. And he finds himself there in battle, and he yells, you know, he said, I had a dream last night, and in my dream, I heard the word attack. And all of a sudden, I had an arrow in my back. <laughs> and so his, his, his cry is, please, Mr. Custer, I don't want to go, okay? And then at a certain point in the song, he always asks, this is sort of the refrain, I guess, he asks, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? <laughs> I think that's a relevant question, isn't it? What are we doing here? Man, I hope you and I understand. We're doing something very important here. Very important. And it's exciting to be part of it. God bless you as we continue this journey. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with us today and forever. Amen. Bless you. Thank you.